right? Then one thing I could do is say that I'm going to constrain my preconditioner P to only have non-zeros where, where, where A does. Yeah? I have no guarantee that the inverse of A actually satisfies this property, but oftentimes uh, you, can, you can write down sparsity patterns that are kind of reasonable guesses for what you might think might happen. Okay. So then what you could do is say, okay, given that constraint, which by the way is just a linear constraint, uh, minimize the, the norm of AP, right? This is what should look like the identity, and you're just going to subtract off the identity and try to get that close to zero, right? And since this optimization only has a, a relatively few variables, right? It only has a number of variables equal to like the number of non-zeros in A. Sometimes you can solve this least squares problem and then plug that in as a preconditioner for your larger system. It's kind of tricky, yeah? It's actually very clever, whoever thought of that. Um, the third one is a method called incomplete Cholesky factorization, and this is a little bit magic. Um, in incomplete Cholesky factorization, what you do is you say, okay, I'm going to pretend like I'm running the Cholesky factorization algorithm on my matrix A. Right? And if you look back, you can do this kind of by only looking at slots where there are non-zeros to start with, and then doing these backward substitutions. And then what you're going to do is, any time that I would induce fill, like I would have to put a non-zero value, into my Cholesky factorization, I'm just not going to write it down. Yeah? And then I'm just going to happily keep marching along and pretend like I had done the right thing in Cholesky factorization. This is called the incomplete Cholesky factorization. It is an engineering uh, marvel, right? So somebody just tried this out and it works very well, and then they went back and you can prove a few properties about this algorithm, but it's actually very tricky. Um, in practice, it works very well because, um, once again, sort of you expect uh, the sparsity pattern of L. Uh, to have some relationship to this person you have in A, and that's what this is captured. Uh, finally, uh, there's a trick called domain decomposition. So oftentimes, remember what, an example that I keep re returning to mostly because I'm a computational geometry guy, is uh, you know, sometimes we'll be doing mathematics on these triangle meshes, right? Kind of look like, like that. Yeah? We, we, when we talked about embedding things on the plane, we saw some of these. And then oftentimes what will happen is I'll have a matrix whose number of non-zeros, huh, this is uh, the opposite of a delineation triangulation, but the, the number of non-zeros in this, this matrix is sort of looks like the number of edges in this graph. So one thing you could do would be to try to solve a graph theory problem. For example, you could try and cut this graph into different pieces. Right? And then effectively what that does is it makes a bunch of small linear systems out of AX equals B because you remove the relationship between different parts of, of this, this domain. Okay. This is called domain decomposition. You just kind of break it into pieces and you solve these approximate subproblems as you're preconditioning. Right? So hopefully you guys get the kind of engineering idea of how preconditioning works. Right? Like you, you, you try and solve some problem that sort of looks similar to AX equals B, but either you, you, you simplify the, the types of A that you really consider, or you kind of look at your domain and break it into pieces and try and, and solve things locally in some, some approximate way. Yeah? This is an engineering decision. Right? We're not going to prove a bunch of theorems about our preconditioners because oftentimes they don't exist. Sometimes they do, but, but not always. Okay. Thankfully, this actually concludes this part of CS205. It's starting next week we're going to do something very different. Uh, in the interest of completeness, I thought I would mention about 4 billion other iterative solvers. Obviously, you're not responsible for being able to derive any of these, and they get very complicated. Uh, so there is one strategy, which if I remember, I'll put on your next homework because it's easy. Uh, it really is easy. Uh, some things I say are easy, apparently aren't, but I think it's nice. Okay? And the idea here is that let's say that I decompose my matrix A into M minus N. I could always do this, for example, by taking M equals zero, but that would be kind of boring. Yeah? And then I say, okay, well, if I have AX equals B, right, that's the same as MX uh, equals NX plus B. Yeah? Nothing too exciting. And so, so what these guys do is sort of similar to the fixed point iteration we talked about before, where we're going to solve this system, mxk equals nxk minus 1 plus b. Right? In other words, you can say xk equals m inverse uh, nxk minus 1 plus m inverse b. This is a fixed point iteration. You see that? So, uh, actually, we, we, we proved in class, when does when is, when is this thing converge? Well, what you have to do is look at the eigenvalues of this matrix, M inverse N, and make sure that their absolute values are all less than 
does, this, this strategy converges. And there, there are lots of different strategies for how you could decompose a matrix A equals M minus N, and that's going to be the kind of challenging part. In fact, I think your, your, your textbook spends more time on, on these methods than conjugate gradient, um, even though we don't use them very often in practice. Uh, one very common thing to do would be, remember that this, this, uh, this algorithm is, is, is completely worthless if, if M is hard to invert, yeah? So usually what you can do is take M to be the diagonal of A, and N to be everything else. <laughs> Right? And sometimes, uh, for, for, for matrices, you, you, you get lucky, and the eigenvalues of this matrix in that case are, are less than one. Uh, one very important case of that is a diagonally dominant matrix, where your diagonal is, is, is larger than anything else in your, in, in your matrix. Yeah. Uh, then, beyond that, there are about four bajillion different iterative schemes that all solve different versions of AX equals B. Right? So, so, a reasonable question you guys should all ask is, like, Okay, so we spent all this time deriving methods for symmetric positive definite matrices, but some matrices, not very many, but some matrices are not symmetric and positive definite, and, um, well, what the heck do we do there? Well, we have one strategy from class, and this was sort of the earliest uh, uh, iterative scheme for, 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 for matrices, for, for conjugate gradients on, on things that aren't, aren't positive definite. Basically, all they do is they say, okay, well, if I can solve AX equals B, then I can solve A transpose A, X equals A transpose B, right? That's normal equations. And A, and A transpose A is always symmetric and positive definite if A is invertible, yeah? And so what we do, well, we just go back into uh, our iterations of CG and we just substitute A transpose A instead of A. Of course, what do you think happens to convergence in this case? It's really bad. Right? Because what do we do? Again, when you compute A transpose A, you square the condition up there. Yeah? So if the convergence of, uh, of, of CG was, was what looks like the square root of your condition number, well, you just lost that square root. Yeah? So you're back to, you might as well do gradient descent. Uh, variation, uh, there are two variations of this strategy. One's called conjugate gradient normal equation residual, which is what I just described. There's also conjugate gradient normal equation error. By the way, for some reason, people in this community uh, like to give everything acronyms, and they're very hard to keep straight. Uh, conjugate gradient normal equation error does the same thing, but does AA transpose instead of A transpose A. Uh, then the next relaxation you might think of for a linear system would be, okay, it's no longer uh, positive definite, but it's at least symmetric. And what is symmetry bias? What is our favorite theorem from eigenstuff? The special theorem. Right? So as long as A is symmetric, we still know a lot about A, right? that he has a full uh, orthogonal eigenspace. And that's going to help a lot with proofs of convergence in a lot of these strategies, where we're going to write things in terms of the eigenvectors and then show that they work. And in particular, two very popular strategies are min-res and sim-lq, uh, both of which basically are derived in a similar way to conjugate gradients. But rather than using that function f that I defined, they write the norm of b minus ax and work from there. Yeah. Then there are methods like LSQR and LSMR. What these guys do is solve the normal equations, uh, basically by minimizing the same G. Right? Remember, this G also works for least squares. And then moving, you know, kind of broadening our class of equations with each of these. There's a whole pile of different methods, everything from uh, the generalized min-res thing to uh, QMR, bi-conjugate gradient, uh, conjugate gradient squared, and bi-conjugate gradient squared stabilized. Um, all of which are different iterative methods that solve AX equals B, and they are very difficult to use. Or rather, not to use, actually. Uh, there are lots of canned implementations of these things, and all they require is that you can uh, multiply vectors by A and by A transpose. But, as you can imagine, the proof of CG was already very complicated, and, and the proof that these guys work and how they're derived is, is actually quite advanced. Right? You have to look at different subspaces and vectors. And some of these, uh, for example, I think by CG stab has to like solve little mini QR factorizations and side of iterations of this thing and so on. Right? They're very, very carefully designed. And finally, in the most broad possible sense, remember we started our story by talking about just generic tools for nonlinear optimization. And one interesting question you could ask is, can you use conjugate gradients to improve a, just a method for minimizing a function f if it's not some quadratic thing? And the answer is yes. And in fact, there are two very well-known methods, Fletcher Reeves and Pollock Riviere, I'm a, I don't speak French. Um, and, and, and basically, they want to minimize a function f, but we no longer know anything about f other than he's differentiable. Right? And so what do these methods do? Well, they now say, okay, we're going to use the same CG iterations, 
But instead of using the residual, every time we compute the residual, we're going to replace that with minus grad f. Because remember, that's why we use the residual. And now, instead of using our formula for alpha, we're going to have to use a line search. Yeah? And other than that, everything stays the same. And somehow these methods are nice, because if your function looks approximately quadratic, they'll converge like CG, and CG is good. Yeah? So if you have a very smooth function, uh, these can be very good strategies, and they don't require the Hessian of f. Right? They just move along the gradient. So anyway, that concludes our discussion of iterative solvers. Right? So over the last uh, two or three weeks, we started with iterative root finders, we did minimization, and then we did constrained minimization, and finally we returned to the linear problem and showed that there's some very special structure there. Yeah? So starting next week, we're going to do something completely different, which is nice, because it's sort of a reset for anybody that's totally lost. We're going to start talking about, uh, if I have some function, how do I integrate it and differentiate it and so on numerically. Uh, and then how can I solve differential equations? And that'll pretty much be the conclusion of 205. So we're in the home stretch. Uh, this is probably the most difficult material this week, and from here it, it, it gets easier. Uh, maybe I'll find a way to make it hard. But yeah. So anyway, if, if we can hit the camera, I think we're done for the day. And uh, I'll see you guys on Monday. And you, uh, good luck with your homework. I'm told it's tricky, so, so you should do it. Thank you.